The trope of a statue, deep in the depths of the dungeon springing to life in order to destroy trespassers, is a classic. Not just in D&D, but in pop culture as a whole. But have you ever wondered specifically what magic is used to make such a creature move? Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only show on the internet that talks about giant stone ladies. Today we'll be talking about the Blackstone Giant, a creature brought to life with a spark of the divine and put to terrible purpose. As always, we're going to go over the creature's history, lore, and ecology, as well as some ways you might use it in a D&D campaign. And of course, we've got some spicy new 5th edition stats and artwork to help bring this monstrosity to life. Strictly speaking, it is a construct, not a monstrosity, but we'll get to that. First, I want to give a massive shout out to this week's sponsor, Dragonair, Silent Gods. Dragonair is an open world high fantasy strategy RPG inspired by TTRPGs, like D&D. You can customize your character, battle through dungeons, and of course roll some dice along the way. The game is entering its second phase and collaborating with Dungeons & Dragons to offer a bunch of new gameplay, events, and tons of content. Both Drist and Air 2 have already made an appearance in the game, but starting with the official launch of Phase 2 on February 23rd, two legendary mages, Elminster Omar and Samaster, will be making their debut. This new adventure will see the players facing off against our old pals, the Cult of the Dragon, and rumors of a Draco Lich. Which seems exactly like the sort of thing Samaster would be wrapped up in. Dragonair has been downloaded over 10 million times worldwide, and you can join those players today by clicking the free download link below and checking it out for yourself. Thank you so much to Dragonair for sponsoring this week's video. Now without further ado, let's talk about the giant 40 foot nightmare statue in the room. The Blackstone Giant first appeared in D&D 3rd Edition as part of the Fiend Folio, which was basically just another monster manual meant to conjure association with the original Fiend Folio, one of the dopest monster books ever printed. And while the new Fiend Folio might not have been as groundbreaking as its namesake, it's a really solid book. Within its pages are some truly iconic monsters including none other than our Monster of the Week. Blackstone Giants are massive statues constructed by the followers of a god. Once the statue is complete, through a divine rite conducted by a cleric of said deity, the statue is brought to life and animated with a spark of the divine. They're typically used as either guardians of a sacred site such as a temple, or they're brought along as powerful bodyguards for the faith's uppermost clergy. And they excel in both roles. I can't help but feel like the Pope wouldn't need his little bulletproof box thing if he traveled with one or two of these guys. As powerful and often brutal agents of destruction, they're typically constructed by clerics following an evil god, or at best, a god of warfare, and as such, they're created to look very scary. Traditionally, they're built with eight arms, a serpentine body, and a vaguely female form. However, there are no hard rules here. If a cleric devoted to a happy-go-lucky deity wants to create a giant who is good aligned or one with male features, they absolutely can. There's nothing stopping them. It's just not typically how this monster is depicted. Speaking of which, I almost forgot to bring up the giant's choice of jewelry. They're usually adorned in gold bands around their wrists or neck, which is pretty standard fancy magic statue stuff. But the giants have taken it upon themselves to improve this look. Since they have the ability to petrify their enemies, they often smash their petrified victims and fasten their stony limbs to the jewelry they wear. So when encountering a giant, if it has been around for a while, it might be wearing a necklace formed of stone heads all strung together like beads, or it could have some arms and legs dangling around its many wrists. And all of that is horrific. I imagine a giant created by a good aligned faith probably wouldn't go to such grisly lengths, but I'm not going to be the one who tells the 40 foot murder statue what they can and can't wear. I imagine you're probably curious though about what exactly this thing is capable of. So let's talk about that. The Blackstone Giant is one of the most brutally effective yet simple to run creatures I've ever covered. Clocking in at CR 17, this thing is no joke. It is a 30 in strength, which is literally as high as it can be. However, the rest of its stats are pretty mediocre. See, the giant is what you'd call a specialist monster, and it specializes 
in turning people into corpses. Its primary method of dealing death is by using its many claws to tear creatures apart. It can make three slam attacks every round that deal a good chunk of slashing damage, and if it manages to knock a creature to zero hit points, it can then cleave using its bonus action to keep the pain train rolling. But the true danger here isn't just getting shredded, because if the initial damage isn't enough to knock you down, you will have to succeed on a constitution saving throw every time this thing hits you to avoid being petrified. So whether you end up clawed or turned into a statue, it's not great. However, what makes this creature even more dynamic are its legendary actions. It had a few actions in the third edition stat block that were very cool, but didn't really fit in with the flow of fifth edition combat, in my opinion. So rather than bloat this creature's stat block with a bunch of different individual actions it can take, I decided we should convert some of those into legendary actions to help it feel a bit more dangerous. It can make a tail attack, and it can try to pass a perception check to find that sneaky rogue who's using the hide action, but it can also use two legendary actions to try and bring a petrified creature to life. Sort of. It doesn't really bring them back to life so much as it animates their stone body. Essentially, this brings a petrified creature into the fight, granting it game statistics equivalent to that of an animated suit of armor. So if there are any petrified creatures in the room, once per turn, it can bring a new ally to life and get some help. This is especially cruel if it happens to petrify one of the party members and then suddenly begins using them as a weapon against the others who are still alive. I mean, you're not really dead when you're petrified, but you're dead. Now, like I said, by default, the animated creature has the stats of an animated suit of armor, but you can adjust that to suit the needs of your specific giant encounter. For a particularly high level fight or a boss battle, maybe it has animated statues with stats equivalent to a stone golem or something. Or maybe the animated creature just has the same stats as it did pre-petrification, except it's a construct now. There are a lot of different things you can do here with this ability specifically, and I encourage you to get creative with it. But if all else fails or you're just looking for a quick stat block you can use, the animated armor should suit this need perfectly fine. And that brings us to our next topic. Just how the heck would you use this thing to tell a story? Well, there are actually plenty of options. Some of them obvious, others a bit more involved. So obviously a big badass guardian statue is going to make for an incredible addition to a dungeon. Having the giant serve as a gatekeeper to a long lost temple ruin or some such location is basically what the creature was designed for. Alternatively, you could have it at the heart of the dungeon, protecting whatever valuable treasure is held within. This can also be an interesting way for you to use this creature with a lower level party. If the goal is not to kill the statue guardian, but rather to steal from the temple and then escape, you could have an interesting little heist on your hands. I also feel like it goes without saying that if the antagonist of your campaign is connected to a god in any way, having a blackstone gigant or two follow them around and acting as a bodyguard is not only super intimidating, but could make for a great addition to a high level final battle. Because I think when using this creature, it's really important to analyze why the person who is in control of the giant had it constructed in the first place. Because a big old statue monster like this is not just a powerful monster, it's a projection of power. It's like when you see an authoritarian regime having a military parade. They don't do that because the missiles need to go for a walk. It's a public show of force. It says, hey, look at all this cool shit we have that can blow stuff up. In much the same way, a Blackstone Gigant shows off how real and tangible that faction's power is. I mean, anyone can have a legion of cultists following them around. But do you have a giant statue animated by magic sourced from a god? Didn't think so. And this extends even to a non-antagonistic role. A Blackstone Gigant can offer a lot just as a set piece. Maybe the ruler of a particular kingdom keeps a pair of giants in their throne room, a fact that any petitioners are all too painfully aware of. And maybe it's just because I've been getting into Warhammer lately, but I can't help but feel like a giant would be an excellent addition to a massive army fighting on behalf of a god or other religious state. Just having one of these things among the ranks of your army is going to stand out in the best way possible. Something I also realized just now while I'm filming this that I didn't already mention is that these guys can talk. I can talk. I'd love to talk. I'm not talking a damn thing I ever saw. Get her out of my sight. They aren't the most intelligent, but they are sentient creatures. So while they may be predisposed to enacting the will of their creator, since they are, in essence, fueled by magic from a god who this creator most likely worships, they're just guys. Like, they can make their own choices and stuff. They're not golems. 
This is important because it means that a gigant could potentially be reasoned with in any of the aforementioned scenarios. They're pretty single-minded, so it's going to be tough convincing it to give up the treasure at the center of the temple it's been guarding for 10,000 years, but... Tough doesn't mean impossible. Or maybe the party is even dealing with a gigant who's gone rogue and will no longer listen to commands for some reason. And maybe the reason they've gone rogue is because their creator is using them in a way that doesn't align with the deity who empowers them. Or you can just do the plot of iRobot with giant statue ladies. But no matter how you choose to use this creature, let me know what you think about it in the comments down below. And if you do want to use it in your game, linked in the description down below, there is a Google document which contains all of the relevant stats and information you will need to bring this to your D&D table. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons over on the Dungeon Dad Patreon page, you can get the Dungeon Dad Patreon Styles 5th Edition stat block in high-res PDF form featuring the new artwork this week done by Dakota Curry. I absolutely love the direction he took this in, and I think it is horrific in the best way possible. If you're not already a patron and that sounds cool to you, I encourage you to check it out. It's three bucks a month and helps me keep the lights turned on. And speaking of patrons, that reminds me, it is time for Patron of the Week! This week's randomly selected patron is Ian Sharp. Thank you so much, Ian, for the cutting edge support you throw my way every month. It means the most. And thank you for watching. As always, if there's a monster from an older edition of D&D or some other tabletop game, or even like a cool movie you like or something, I don't know, let me know in the comments down below. And who knows? You might just see it show up on an episode of Monster of the Week. And while you're down there, consider liking the video. That helps a lot if you're not subscribed. That also helps a lot. But most importantly, thank you so much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Till then. This mysterious creature comes from a somewhere very far away. A different universe entirely. But if it's good enough for Dune, it's good enough for Dungeon Dad. The spice must flow. Next episode, Orange Seer. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.